Welcome to Insights and Sound, where we talk to the people behind the scenes, behind the technology, and behind the music. People you may not know, but you should. And please check out getitinwriting.net forward slash shows for a full list of our podcast YouTube series. My guest is attorney David Helfand. He is uh, about as much of an overachiever as I can possibly imagine. <laughs> you have represented both artists and companies. Uh, I'm, I'm going to cheat and get out the, the really short list sure. here, okay? Because it was, uh, the truth of the matter is that the list is so long that we will be spending way too much of both of our time if I actually try and read it all. But, uh, okay, short list. Uh, you have represented or worked with Slash, Van Halen, Yes, Teddy Pendergrass, Dan Lee Clark, Dan Lee Korchmar, Doug Weston's Troubadour, as well as Columbia Pictures, Walt Disney Company, Paramount Pictures, Sony Pictures. You have been chairman of the board of the Guitar Center Music Foundation. You are the adjunct professor of law at Southwestern University. And do you sleep? <laughs> Not at all. Mm, yeah. It's overrated. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you, you really, um, you have been so involved in this industry for so long. And... One of the things that I'm rather fascinated about is the fact that you, you've you played both sides of the fence, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Now, you come to this as an artist, right? You, you mentioned earlier that you've, you're a lifelong guitar player. Right. You uh, obviously took up law after you took up guitar, Correct. I, would, I would presume, right? That was the backup plan since I didn't think I'd get a record deal. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, and, and you see, now, I, I've always found that fascinating, too, because... There's the whole left brain, right brain thing, mm -hmm. you know. And musicians, of course, you know, everybody thinks of us as right brain creative, you know, right. out there. The truth of the matter is every musician I know is super analytical. Mm -hmm. There's a hugely strong left brain component right. there. That's true. And I find it interesting that you manifested that in, in the legal profession, mm -hmm. which is so detail-oriented and everything. Yeah. It's almost the antithesis of being an artist, isn't it? Yeah, yeah but, you know, it's funny because... Shortly after I moved to L.A. to go to law school, I was at a party one night in Westwood, and I run into a girl that I went to college with. And she says, oh, my God, what are you doing here? And I said, I'm going to law school. And she started cracking up. And I said, why are you laughing? She goes, you're a musician. You can't be a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> so some people don't see the correlation. The two worlds seem on the surface to right. be so separated and almost diametrically opposed in certain right. ways. The typical mi mindset of the musician is the, uh, the very artistic, free-flowing, sure. but the stereotypical attorney's mindset is, in certain ways, almost, almost opposed to that. Right. I actually think that it's helped me a great deal in not only my business, but keeping clients. Um, years ago, I was representing uh, Mitsubishi. I was their United States representative, and they had a band uh, signed to the uh, label. And uh, he was a percussion player, Carl Perrazzo. Oh, uh -huh. um, And Carl ended up ultimately uh, joining uh, Carlos Santana's band. Mm -hmm. So um, I was managing Neil Sean at the time, and I went up to San Francisco, and I, I think they were doing a co-headlining thing, and. I'm backstage and I sneak up behind Carl and I put my, my hands around him and he turns around and he goes, who is that? And he looks at me and he goes, holy shit, the only lawyer I like. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's like I, I try and use the skills of both mm -hmm. to create that balance. It also helps me understand from a practical side, you know, what the client is feeling. Which also no doubt encourages the trust relationship yeah. there yeah but how has it been for you in terms of playing both sides of that in terms of uh you know representing the artists in some yeah. cases and also representing the the companies who right. for better or worse have been sort of vilified i i put it this way there are two types of lawyers the deal makers and the deal breakers and i like to think of myself as a deal maker and whether i'm on the corporate side or the talent side I know at the end of the day, 98% of the time, the parties want to make a deal. So you find a compromise that people can live with. Um, some people enjoy the fact of pounding their chest and saying, ah, 
I protected you and the deal fell apart, but you would have been screwed otherwise. But you know, I, I, at the end of the day, it's always the client's decision. I remember I was negotiating a deal in 1985. It was an artist that was just about to sign a big record deal. Um, and the terms of the deal were horrible. And I looked at the contract and I said to the client, if I were you, I wouldn't sign this. I said, but it's your career and your life. You do whatever you want. And she ended up signing the agreement. First album sold four and a half million copies. They had 10 top 10 singles in the first two or three albums. And she made the right decision. And the minute we had success, we went back in and renegotiated. So, you know, at the end of the day, I, I, I advise and counsel, but the client makes the decision. Of course. Yeah. Does the fact that the client tends to be an artist and therefore somewhat ruled by emotion rather than business sense, uh, is that a major factor or do you find that artists are more savvy than people give them credit for? I, I think it depends on the client. I find some people are incredibly savvy by way of example. Um, I ended up having the good fortune of representing Teddy Pendergrass for a while. Uh. And this was at the, really the end of his life. The accident had already occurred. He had written a book. And Shep Gordon and uh, Danny Marcus asked me if I'd represent Teddy and help him option the book rights to turn it into a biopic. And so I said, of course, be, I'd be honored to represent Teddy. And what I found so fascinating was when the agreement was drafted, he would get on the phone with me, he'd ask me questions about every paragraph, and I was so impressed that he cared enough, because sometimes I get clients that go, if you say it's okay, I'll sign it. Yeah, just handle it, right? <laughs> yeah. And, but, and Te but Teddy was a classic example of someone that really wanted to learn and understand and know what he was signing, and I found that fantastic. And th that's interesting. Now, of course, you know, what you point to there is also Teddy had the forced opportunity, shall we say, to realign certain priorities. So right. Now, I, no question. I worked years ago with uh, Jan Berry mm -hmm. after his accident. Right. And what fascinated me was that even though he had a severe case of aphasia, he was perhaps more attuned to the aspects of his career mm -hmm. and uh, you know I was working with him in his studio right. and he was fascinated by the technology all these things that he even admitted to me you know back when I was really working I didn't care about mm -hmm. that stuff you know yeah. but I think there's sort of there, there may be sort of a realigning of priorities sure. there sure. you know forced by what's that term um, crisis living mm -hmm. you know, there's a great book about that um, right. And I believe that's the title of it, or close to that. Yeah. But um, you know, when we have life impacting incidents that re realign our priorities, mm -hmm. and um, I believe, if I heard right, you're a cancer survivor. Yeah. I, in fact, I just came back uh, one day ago from my annual checkup, uh -huh. and it's been 19 years since I survived cancer. So my priorities were totally realigned. I'll bet. Yeah. I'll bet. How, I mean, so how, you had kids when, when you mm -hmm. were diagnosed, I assume. Yeah, yeah. That's one of the, that's got to be one of the most difficult things, I'm sure, yeah, just, yeah. you know, thinking about your future, your, mm -hmm. um, the legacy we leave and all of that. I no think question. that's a... The first, when I was told by the doctor that I had cancer, the first thing I thought of is I didn't spend enough time with my family. I was too focused on my work. Mm -hmm. And you justify it by saying, if I don't make money, my family can't eat. So it's a little bit of a rat race, yeah, but yeah. definitely that. And I never used to go on vacation. And now I make sure that I go on at least two or three trips a year. That's interesting. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I have been, so far, fortunate enough to not have any kind of life-threatening situation. Right. But um, I made similar decisions years ago. Mm -hmm. You know, there's just, there's... You know, you do come to the realization that the work you do is part of who you are, but it's not who you are. Right, right. And, and you know, I think, obviously, you've accomplished a lot, and you've right. been uh, involved in a lot of things, but ultimately, it comes mm -hmm. down to what kind of legacy you leave, mm -hmm. which is yeah. also why I think it's, it's, um, 
it's great that you're working in all of the, um, you seem to do a lot of stuff that's just for the good. And I, you know, I mm -hmm. mean, obviously there's, there's dollar signs behind everything, we right. know that. Right. But you, um, you've taken on some interesting projects mm -hmm. lately. Mm -hmm. I've been on a lot of nonprofit boards over the years. Mm -hmm. I, I'm currently, for the last five years, I was the chairman of the Guitar Center Foundation. I was on uh, the Henry Mancini uh, board uh, uh, with Ginny, uh, which was great. I've been on the Beverly Hills Bar Association board. I like to think that giving back is part of the obligation of having some modicum of success. Because if you don't give back, you're an asshole. Yes, <laughs> yes. Well, and also, I mean, you know, we could get into the whole esoteric question here of how one defines success, right. you know. But on our own terms, as long as we have right. reached some level of success, right. I, mean, I think it's truly important to be giving back in whatever way possible. Right. I know that, uh, I mean, you and I, we both mentor people. Right. You know, and I think that, that to me is one of mm -hmm. the most important things yeah. because in addition to helping people learn, right. it also keeps us in touch with no a, younger, a younger demographic no in that question. sense. And I, I don't equate how many uh, zeros you have in your bank account with success. Yeah. Uh, it's just never been something that I've focused on. And uh, I've had people say to me, if you didn't do as much charity work, you'd have a bigger house. And that's like, really? I don't know. I mean, I, you know, people have, have told me that, uh, have told me similar things about, mm -hmm. you know, whether or not you're monetizing everything you do. Right. And, you know, for example, this, this, this podcast that I do, mm -hmm. I have not really monetized right. it. And part of the reason is because I always felt like this is telling stories about the value of the people in our yeah. industry, what sure. we do, who we do it with, yeah. how we do it, and I think yeah. that's, those are unsung yeah. stories in a lot yeah. of senses. Yeah, I mean, I have epiphanies regularly about, you know, things that I've accomplished or how my life has changed. I, when the pandemic started, I have about 12,000 CDs in my house. And so I was organizing, and I came across the deluxe edition of Carol King's Tapestry. Oh, uh -huh. And I hadn't opened it. It still had the shrink wrap on it. And I thought, you know, I, I don't know why I didn't open it, but I opened it up, and I start reading the liner notes. And I remember being in uh, maybe 10th or 11th grade and fantasizing, oh, I want to be a, a musician someday, and I want to be in the record business. And here I was reading the liner notes, and I represented the drummer that played on the record, the bass player, um, the guitar player, um, Curtis Amy, who did all the horns and flutes, uh, Mary Clayton, who was a dear friend of mine, Curtis's wife. And it was like, holy shit. I went from fantasizing about the music to saying, I can't believe that these people are now my friends and my clients. And that, to me, that's success. It's a wonderful feeling. Yeah. So I want to get into a little bit of technology with you. Okay. We were talking about that earlier. Mm -hmm. Not in the sense of analyzing the technology itself, but mm -hmm. you have worked with both artists and companies through mm -hmm. arguably the most change-ridden era of our industry. Right. Intellectual property has changed the way we mm -hmm. create music, the way we consume music. Everything mm -hmm. has yep. pretty much turned on its head. Yep. The creative process yep. has turned on its head. No question. How has that influenced, well, first of all, how has it influenced your perspective on the okay, industry? Okay, so this may sound corny, but I, I use this line quite a bit. You know, 15 years ago, we would sell a CD and give away a T-shirt. Now we sell the t-shirt and give away the CD. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> it's like, it doesn't matter how you monetize it. If you can figure out a way to create a revenue stream, you know, the models change, but as long as you can figure out a way to make money to allow you to continue to be a creative, I mean, that's the most important thing. Uh, you know, I've seen so many technological changes over the years 
In 2007, I was head of A&R at a record company called Emergent Records, mm -hmm. distributed by Sony Red. And we had, you know, probably 20 acts signed to the label. And we also had a production facility and a studio. And um, I got a phone call one day from a buddy of mine who I went to high school with, who said, the music business is going in the toilet, but touring and the internet is really the new thing. So he says, I've come up with an idea. I'm gonna create the first ever online interactive concert venue in the world. And I'd like you to be a first round investor. And I was blown away by the concept and I said, oh shit, this is it. And I, I became an investor. Bill Kerbishley, who managed The Who and Led Zeppelin, was an investor. Uh, Tom Ross was an investor. We had a really, Larry, um, who managed Britney. Uh -huh. um, um, so we had a really good think tank of people that all believed in the concept. And ultimately, I became a consultant to the company, and then they hired me to be the COO of the company. And when I went out to the record companies and the publishers, because my partner said, if we're going to do concerts and we're going to create content, we need to make sure we have a blanket license so that we don't have to renegotiate a deal every time we book an act at the venue. So I went to all the record companies and the publishing companies and I explained the model and they all thought I was crazy. They said, nobody's gonna watch music on the internet. <laughs> really? And I hmm. said, that's why you guys are struggling to make money. And ironically, you know, we partnered with Facebook and then we, we Unfortunately, it didn't have the runway to continue to keep the company open, and we went out of business. Uh, but I, the first thing I thought of is, holy shit, if we had that company, when the pandemic hit, <clears throat> I'd be hanging out with Elon Musk. <laughs> <laughs> Might have my island next to his. It's um, funny, there were a few companies that started up doing stuff like that during the pandemic. Rehearsals.com. Yeah. They were our biggest uh, Hello competitor. Hello TV was another one. Right, uh -huh. right. And yeah. the ones that stayed alive uh, made some money. And, you know, like everything else, it's not as critically important as it, as it was then. I mean, we had state-of-the-art cameras. We had equipment. We were basically a television network that was broadcasting on the Internet. Yes. And my, my partners believed that it had to be state-of-the-art. And when I, when I left the company to move back to L.A., I said, when was the last time that a kid looked at you and said, I'm never going to watch YouTube again, the quality sucks? Yes, <laughs> exactly. It's about the content. Well, and, and, you know, that always makes me laugh when people get obsessed about gear like that. You know, right. it's, uh, it, it's like, you know, when's the last time somebody said, God, I love the snare on that record. Right. Right. You know, it's about, right. it's about the end product and it's right. about the experience. Right. Well, reminds me of when, when I was at Paramount, they told me the story. I wasn't at the studio at the time, but um, Celine Dion recorded, um, you know, the theme song for the Titanic. And the original demo was recorded in her hotel room. Well, after James Cameron decided that he liked the song enough to put it in the film, they went back into the studio and re-recorded and he ultimately defaulted to Selene's vocal performance from the hotel room because of the energy and the passion, oh, even yeah. though it might not have been as pristine as the studio version. So it's all about feel. It is, and in fact, that's one of the things that, you know, I taught, I taught recording in college for a while, and one of the things that I was really a stickler for was the idea of the creative process itself. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I find both fascinating and sometimes a little disheartening is the fact that technology has now changed the way we create music mm -hmm. to the point where there's very little of that interaction, that actual ensemble interaction that you get when you're playing in right. a band with someone. Sure. You know, you, two people, three people, whatever, you're playing off of each other. And that spontaneity, that creative yeah. process that happens, we don't see that as much right. anymore. Right. Well. You know, Carol King mentions that in the Immediate Family documentary. Yes. Mm -hmm. When they did Tapestry, it was everybody in the same room and they'd figure out which take was the best. There were no overdubs. Yeah. I mean, yes, you know, I, I have mad respect for these people who can cut up a vocal and take 147 vocal takes and make one right. cohesive performance out yeah. of it. But it's different. Uh, 
And, and I wonder how that has, has, has that changed for you at all the nature of the artists that you work with? Yeah, but I mean, I, I work also with a lot of uh, older legacy acts, uh -huh. and they tend to skew back to the older days of recording. Yes, of course. Um, but, you know. It's... But I'm, I'm looking for, uh, from, from you, I'm thinking, because you work with, with older artists as well as more current artists, do you see a difference in their, in their mentality toward their art? Yeah, um, I think it's, it was easier 30 years ago to uh, create a buzz. Um, I, I remember um, I got a, a band signed to uh, DreamWorks one time, and uh, the A&R guy spent half the time watching the band, which mm -hmm. was at the Troubadour, and the other half of the time watching the audience. Okay? Of course. And so it's like, okay. Doing his homework. The vibe, and if we took our team and put it behind this brand, we could blow it up. Mm -hmm. Now, the uh, people go to social media and they look and see how many friends you have on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And that's how they decide if you have a passionate audience and fan base. It doesn't necessarily equate to people caring about you or wanting to spend money on your brand. So it's a very different analysis. It is. It is, definitely. Now, because you approach a lot of these artists with this really how shall I say, sort of a nurturing mentality. Mm -hmm. Do you find that you are ever torn, especially now in what is arguably almost a post-major label era? Right. Do you find yourself torn between advising them to get a record deal versus not get a record deal? You know, you were mentioning earlier about advising an artist. You know, if there was one cookie cut away for everybody to become successful, everybody would do it. Yeah. And the truth is, every situation works differently, and you never know what that magic moment's gonna be. Sometimes it's a song breaking on the radio, sometimes it's a song becoming viral, sometimes it's a placement in a movie. Um, you know, it just, you just never know what that, that shining moment's gonna be. That's why I say to people, do, try and do everything. Throw as much as you, as you can at the wall, and eventually something's going to stick. Do you find that younger people now are more prone to have that mentality, to be more uh, multifaceted in that sense? I, I think it's a different kind of thing. You know, 20, 30 years ago, you know, the artist would say to me, hey man, just get me in a van and I'll play every <laughs> night and I don't care if I eat hamburgers and sleep on the floor. And now it's about social media posts. How many times a day do I have to post to keep my fans engaged? So it, there's a work ethic for both, but it's dramatically different. Mm -hmm. Any preference? Are you no. old school? I think it depends on what works for the person. Mm -hmm. You know? And, and you've managed to somehow stay in that and keep and, and be able to coach them even in this in this right. modern era sure does anything change the model has changed dramatically um you're right a lot of people don't want record deals anymore they want to own their own copyrights they want to be able to control their brand the difficult part whether you have a record company or you release your content um, yourself you need marketing dollars. And so sometimes it's challenging for people to execute in the right way if they're doing it independently and still have the same impact because whether you like it or not, you have to have a team. Whether yes. you pay for it or whether the record company pays for it or your publisher for that matter. Some people get publishing deals and that becomes the revenue stream and then they distribute the records themselves. Yeah, you mentioned marketing, mm -hmm. and marketing is one area that, again, because of the internet, has so dramatically changed, and it's, it's really almost as if most of the musicians that are coming up now, they really, they understand marketing yes. better than the labels did, Absolutely. in a sense. Absolutely. And that has to and, do with... And I think they have to, mm -hmm. because it's a requirement of the job. You know, 20, 30 years ago, 
you would be at the whim or you know the directives of the label and you would say just tell me what to do and I'll do it. Now if you don't have a deal or you don't want a deal you have to figure out how to execute. Very different mindset. It is, it is and yet in a certain way I think it, it kind of it, it separates the grown-ups from the kids doesn't it? No question because you still have to have a work ethic. Yeah. And you know if I'm managing somebody and I'm working harder on their career than they are, then that's frustrating. That's, that's a danger sign, right? yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's always a team effort. Mm -hmm. So, put yourself in the position of a young person coming up now. Obviously, you know, you made a choice to have a day job, mm -hmm. so to speak worked mm -hmm. out well for you and you were able to still maintain your passion at the right. same time right which is very fortunate sure. you know obviously what would you advise 15 year old you coming up in this day and age well when I was 17 years old um, I would walk around I'd have a guitar in one hand and a camera in the other <laughs> and that, that's who I was and I, I walked into my guidance counselor and she looked at me and she said, we're getting close to graduation. What do you want to be when you grow up? Uh -huh. And I said, I think I'm going to be a lawyer. And she started laughing. And I said, what are you laughing about? And she goes, well, you know, you don't really have the grades and you don't really have the initiative and determination. And what I would say to any artist is, if you really believe that you're put on this planet to be an artist and a performer, don't let anybody stand in your way. Don't let anyone tell you you can't do it. And you just keep going until you figure out the, the right formula for success. Because people told me, hey, you're never going to be a lawyer. And maybe on paper, it didn't look like I had the acumen, but I had the determination and the drive to do it. And it's all about how badly you want it. But there's a difference between saying, I want to be an artist or I have to be an artist. If you feel that you've put, been put on this planet to perform and play music for people, that's very different than saying, it looks glamorous or it looks like, hey, I could, I could make money. I could do that. Or in the old days, I mean, some of my clients, when I would ask them in the beginning uh, of my working with them, so why did you become an artist? And they would go, for the chicks, man. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. It, to me, it's always about the passion that you have for the music. So you, you still maintain your passion for music, obviously. My, fa my friends all make fun of me. I'm out five, sometimes six nights a week, listening to music, going to shows, meeting with people. And they say, how do you have the energy at your age to do that? But to me, it's like breathing or eating food. It's just part of what keeps me alive. And I, I think for, for a lot of my colleagues in the business, they are intrigued by the fact that it appears that I'm more passionate about the music than them, even though they might be on the creative side and I'm more on the business side. But I, I get such a charge out of listening to live music and seeing people perform and to me I mean there's nothing better than going to a great show. Oh I agree I mm -hmm. agree but it also I think a lot of it does have to do with the fact that you still have that passion not just for the music itself right. not just just that you're a music lover but yet that you are you have an appreciation and an understanding of what goes into it. No question. And you know that's the good and the bad. Right. Right. You know, because making music is not easy and it's not always pretty. Yep, yep. You've found a space here that not too many people really occupy. Yeah, and it's confusing to people sometimes. I'll bet. I was I'll managing bet. a band on Geffen one time and they invited me, the record was getting ready to come out and they invited me into their marketing meeting. And I walk in and the head of marketing looks at me and he goes, so what are you today, David? Are you the lawyer, the manager, the <laughs> producer? I mean, what, what is your role? And that's confusing to people because in this industry, you get put in a box 
and you, you're not supposed to veer outside that box. And for me, one of the reasons why I think I'm still passionate is I get different levels of enjoyment out of doing different things. Like, you know, right now I'm working on uh, two movies as a music supervisor. And it's a totally different mindset and a different passion. Um, and um, not everybody wants to do it or cares to do it. I enjoy doing different things for different clients. You know, part of, I think, the creative process, whether you're writing a song, directing a movie, whatever it is, is, is problem solving, right. essentially. Right. And in that sense, you know, it all does come together in the same way. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you took the words out of my mouth because one of the things I wanted to ask you was sort of how you want to be viewed, how you would like mm -hmm. to be viewed. And you have the ability to put yourself in the place of all of these different cogs in the wheel, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's, um, that's a rare thing. Uh -huh. You are able to then bring almost that, that organization and sensibility to the chaos of the mm -hmm. the creative process right, right you find yourself in that position a lot yeah I mean I you know if if I thought about how I would want people to think of my uh, my life and my, my um, career um, it, 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 the simplest way to say it is David um, David's efforts and energies did things in a positive way to help people's lives. I mean, it's just that simple. When, when I asked my mom, she was on her deathbed, how she wanted to be remembered, she said to me, I don't give a fuck what they think. <laughs> <laughs> but for me, it, it, it's important for me to know that I made a contribution that changed the quality of people's lives. I think that's good, especially yeah. for a lawyer. Yeah. You've, 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 given, you've given a good name to, uh, to a profession that is sometimes maligned. Mm -hmm. right. you know? yep. And you're working right now on, um, I, or I don't know if it's finished or not, but a movie about the, the troubadour, Doug Weston, right? Correct, a docuseries, yeah. I've yeah. been working with the troupe for many, many years. Um, Doug died in 1997, and before he died, I made a promise to him that I would make a movie on his life and the history of the club. And uh, I feel like he's with me all the time. And he's constantly guiding me in the right direction. And we're actually getting ready to go into production soon. And one of the things that's interesting, you were talking about technology. Um, I acquired some footage that had been shot of Doug before he passed away. And the person who shot the footage was not a filmmaker. And so the quality of the footage was not as good as it could have been. It's taken me many years to get the project together and organized. And now that we're right on the starting line, and all of a sudden with the impact of AI, I can now take that footage that I had a Doug and make it look like I interviewed him yesterday. Ooh. So it's sometimes things work out the way they're supposed to, mm -hmm. you know. Well, that's funny. You know, uh, um, I was chatting with our mutual friend Danny Tedesco recently. Mm -hmm. We were talking about that too. The how the technology advanced right. as he was making the the uh, the Wrecking Crew yep, movie. Yep. And you know, again, it's it, it's fascinating to me that things have changed so much, and yet. Thankfully, we're able to now integrate a lot right. of that older content, sure. which is just really wonderful because there's yeah. so much stuff that would really be a shame to lose. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. I actually saw a demo two days ago. Uh, one of my buddies uh, runs the estate for his father. His father was a very famous uh, guitar player, and he created... Uh, this AI technology that he demonstrated to me and you could sit uh, and ask his father questions and oh. obviously he's not around mm -hmm. and not only would he answer but the answers seemed like the answers that his father would have given and I was just blown away. Wow, so the AI could actually learn the personality. Well yeah, because they get pro it gets programmed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fascinating. Yeah. So, I mean, 
it may be as one of the components of the Troubadour project that, you know, on the website, you can go and talk to Doug in real time and he'll tell you everything about his career. <laughs> as crazy as that sounds. It's, you know, it, it's both fascinating and frightening if you yeah. think about it. Yeah, you know? no, there's good and bad aspects to it for sure. Yeah, well, that, yeah, and in fact, that must be challenging for you as an attorney now dealing with all of that stuff. Yeah. That's a whole new frontier, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I worry about it, particularly in the context of today's political uh, environment. Yes, yeah. yes, because it, it can be, it's a superpower that can be used for yeah. evil. Yeah, because it's, sometimes it's no longer about the issues, it's about the spin. Yes, yeah, yeah it's true. Yeah. Well, I'm glad for you that you're still able to do what you love. Clearly you show no signs of uh, slowing down or retiring right. anytime soon. Right, and you know, I was having a conversation with Jay Cooper one time and I said, so Jay, when are you going to retire? And he goes, when I die. And at the time, it seemed odd to me. <laughs> it was like, don't you want to enjoy your life? But to him, doing what he did in the office and working with artists was the greatest thing in his life. And I totally get it now. Oh, yeah. I didn't necessarily get it when I asked him the question. Oh, Jay was a, rem a re remarkable guy. Yeah. No question about it. Yeah. And he's another one. I mean, I've had numerous conversations with him about this. In fact, I was the dinner chair the year that the Beverly Hills Bar honored him as Entertainment Lawyer of the Year. Uh -huh. And uh, he got up at the end of the evening, and we'd never really done this before, and him and his wife played music. <laughs> nice. So he also straddled, I mean, he will tell you stories about being in the band with Sinatra. You know, wow. he, so he, he, you know, he straddled that fence too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, and I think it's also been fortunate for a lot of artists to be able to find attorneys that are not really attorneys in that right. sense. I mean, yes, of course you are, right. you know, functionally and legally an attorney, right. but who understand, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the flip side, shall yeah. we say. Yeah, you I know? mean, I, many years ago, um, I got a phone call from an A&R guy and he said, I really want to do a tribute album for Lowell George, but I can't get anybody to give me the money. And he says, can you help? And I went, not only can I help, I can get the funding and distribution for the record. I was representing a record company in Japan, and the head of A&R, who was a dear friend of mine, Little Feet and Lowell George was one of his favorite acts. Oh. So he says, I'll write you the check right now. So. I executive produced the album. I did all the contracts. I a and would the record. I supervised every mix. I got the distribution deal in America with BMG. And I remember going through the process and Jackson Brown was on the record, and Bonnie Raitt, and Little Feet, and J.D. Souther, Randy Newman, Valerie Carter, the Bottle Rockets. And I made sure that I worked the business side and the creative side to create the best record that I could create. And that was a fun thing. I remember um, JD was getting ready to lock his track in and he was, he was really kind of my conduit to all the talent because he was very close to Lowell. Mm -hmm. He's also very friendly with Jackson and Bonnie. And he knows everybody. He knows yeah, everybody. True. And so yeah. he really helped me navigate through it. And when it came time to mix his track, he calls me up and he goes, can you come down to the studio? I'm like, yeah, of course. So I go down to the studio, he puts me right in front of the board, and he says, I'm not gonna tell you anything, I'm just gonna play you the track, and I want you to critique it. I went, okay, fine. Plays me the track, I critique it, and he starts smiling, and he goes, that's exactly what I wanted to hear. <laughs> and it was like, it was interesting to me that he respected my opinion enough to ask me what I thought. So, you know, I've been managing Val Garay for the last five years. Oh, I love Val. He's got a hundred gold and platinum records. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, you know, you're the only lawyer I've ever worked with that I would ask for their opinion about something musical. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a good position to be in. Yeah. Yeah, we were working on a record one time and I didn't think the vocal was loud enough in the mix. And I call up Val, I go, Val, you know, I'm really kind of struggling. I need, I need another half of DB or another DB on the vocal. Oh, no, you're crazy. It's perfect. And we hung <laughs> up, and 
he, without telling me, he went ahead and punched up the vocal. He calls me the next morning and goes, you were so right. <laughs> <laughs> and that made me feel good because I felt like I was making a contribution, not just to the business side of it, but to make sure that the record came out a little better. And that's actually in certain ways even more important. Because if you're not equally behind, well, you have to yeah, do both. yeah, okay, equally yeah. important. Because if you're mm -hmm. not behind it creatively, right. it's going to be harder to it's going to be harder to market it. Sure. It's going to be harder to stand behind it sure. on every level. Right. right. So it's 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 um, I think in certain ways you are the ultimate 360 deal, aren't you? <laughs> I, I, I try and bring value in different areas. Um, you know, years ago when I was working on this. Uh, internet concert venue. Um, I got a phone call one day. Uh, the American Idol touring company was coming to Vegas. And they said, would you like to come to the show and meet the kids? I'm like, yeah, of course. So I go, this was season seven, and uh, I'm backstage and I'm talking to some of the kids and one of the people on the show that year was Jason Castro. Um, and I mean, I didn't think much about it. And about a month later, I get a phone call, and they said, ja Jason's looking for representation. Would you like to fly to Dallas and meet with him and talk about representation? So I did. I thought Jason was really talented, and I flew to uh, Dallas to see the show. We spent about two hours backstage, and he's, you know, what, why do you think you could help me? And what would you bring to the table? And I was explaining to him what, what I thought he needed to do next in his career. And at the end of the conversation, he goes, you don't talk like a lawyer. You talk like a marketing guy. <laughs> and I thought, you know, th that was a compliment. <laughs> it, it, it is. It mm -hmm. is. And, you know, it's funny because I've, I've run a publicist and marketing business right. for the last 20 some odd years. Right. And at some point, I realized that my input was valued not in spite of that, but because of right. that. Because in addition to having worked as a musician and worked as a producer and an engineer, right. I had this other perspective. Sure. And you, you also, you bring this completely different perspective to the equation right. that I think a lot of people miss. Sure, sure. You know, because it, that's as much as I will reiterate that musicians have a strong left brain component. Mm -hmm. There's not always a balance there. Right. And you know, I have many clients who could care less what I think about their music. <laughs> it's like, you know, they don't ask for my opinion. They mm -hmm. just, when the project's finished, they, they give it to me to listen to. I, I actually, I was in Hawaii recently and I was staying at Chet Gordon's house and, you know, I, I represent Alice and I, I said to him, you know, what do you think about the new solo record? And he goes, yeah, what about it? And I said, well, I mean, how much do you get into the music? And he goes, you know, I'm really a marketing guy. And so he goes, Bob Ezrin and Alice, they do their thing and they create the music and then I figure out how to market it when they're finished, but I don't try and get in their way. And so you have to understand, every client's different, your role is different in every project. And so some people want that input from you and some people don't. And you just have to know who your client is. That is true. On the other hand, I think it's a hell of a lot easier to market something if you actually do like and believe in it. Absolutely. You know, I mean, yes, it's possible right. to do so if you don't, but I think it's a lot harder to come across with authenticity. Isn't right. It? I totally agree. I think when you're passionate about what you're shopping, the buyer can feel it. Yeah. You don't come across like a slimy salesperson, yeah. you know? Yeah. I remember I was, uh, I was managing Jennifer Love Hewitt. She was ten and a half. Wow. Maybe you do 11, go back a ways maybe with her. Maybe eleven. I signed her when she was ten. Wow. And I brought her into Atlantic Records, and Doug Morris was running the label at the time, and he had his whole A and R team, and uh, she did three songs to a track. Um, and uh, you know, he calls me later, and he says, you know, she's a little young. I, I don't think we can sign her now. And he says, but come back when she's 16 and I'll give you a deal. And I said, boy, Doug, that's really unfortunate because when she's 16, she's already going to be signed to another label. And he <laughs> said, oh, you're pretty confident, aren't you? 
And I said, well, I really believe in her talent. And sure enough, six months later, I signed her to BMG. Uh -huh. <laughs> and ultimately, she ended up on Atlantic when she was 15 or 16. <laughs> but I actually had two deals before we ended up getting to Atlantic, uh, which was actually good for her, too, because it really taught her the skills that she needed when she had that opportunity to work with Doug and all. But, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, everybody sees something different. I mean, for, for Doug, the idea of signing a 10-year-old girl was taboo. And I said, well, what about Michael Jackson? He goes, that's a boy. So he, to him, there was a difference. Interesting. Between, well, remember, this is early 90s. Sure. The, sure. the environment was different then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's true. Yeah. Although, again, you know, it's all a matter of perspective. Right. Yeah. Is there something in your career that you feel really stands out as something that you are particularly proud of? If you have to pick one thing. It's hard to pick one thing, but I, going back to the Lowell George record, when I think about and I, when I go back and listen to the record, I think as a collective body of work, it's one of the best things I've ever done. I, I feel like I'm, I, I'm proud of what I was able to put together and, you know, the diversity of the artists that were on the record. Um, you know, it started out with some great material to begin with there too. Right? Uh, the songs were amazing, but yeah. you know, I went to Warner's and I said to them, you guys should put out this record and you haven't remastered the catalog. This would be a perfect opportunity to do all the reissues. And, and then you drop the Lowell Tribute album. Yeah. Oh yeah, great idea. We'll call you back in a few days. And then I get a phone call uh, three days later and they said, you know, we, we looked at the numbers. We never made them any money on Little Feet. So why would we spend any more money on the brand? And Are so I, we ended up licensing it to BMG. So, you know, sometimes it's an economic decision, but I think in terms of the quality of the record and the performances, it's one of the things I'm really proud of. Yeah, I would say, I mean, to me, that's a tremendously overlooked band. You know, mm -hmm. they're still not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I know, I know. <laughs> you know, so, uh, yeah. Because they were musicians' musicians. They were, they yeah. were, and the fact that they could... I, they never had an number one record. No, but the fact yeah. that they could, you know, within the space of one song, you know, move so fluidly from yeah. within, you know, multiple genres. No question. Just amazing musicians and really great musicianship right, right. and songs. Yeah, and when I was making that record, I couldn't get anyone to re-record Dixie Chicken. And they said it's because it's so iconic yeah. that no one could ever do as good a job, so they didn't want to touch it. Oh, I get it. I get yeah. it. You know, I mean, everything down to the lyric itself, you know, the punchline at the right. end of that song, you know, right. but uh, the live version, you yeah. know, who can touch that? Yeah. Because again, you know, it goes through, literally, yeah. it's like a musical journey in a yeah, sense. Yeah, no question. You know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, you've done some amazing work. Tried. Mm -hmm. yeah. The journey's not over. Thankfully. Um, I, I always say to people, the best is yet to come. And, you know, speaking about uh, Denny Tedesco, I mean, very proud of what we were able to accomplish with the Immediate Family documentary. Agreed. You know, we worked for four and a half years on the film. And uh, intuitively, I felt like we were making a good movie. But you really never know until the public weighs in. Um, I, I always like to quote Sly Stallone, making a movie is like getting dressed in the closet with the lights off. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's great. I've never heard that. Yeah. So mm. you really don't know until other people look at it from a different objective standpoint. And for me, the defining moment was seeing that we had a 100% rating on Rotten Tomatoes. Ooh. And I'm like, yeah. Star Wars didn't get that. You know, Avatar didn't get that. I, I was on the phone the other day uh, with Joe Satriani. It was my first call with Joe, and we were just chatting, and I mentioned the immediate family. He goes, oh my God, that movie. Oh, those guys changed my life. And I'm like, really? You saw the movie? So it, it's amazing how many people it's actually touched. Oh, I, it's I, true. I, I haven't talked to one person who said anything critical about it, and that's so unusual. Well, you know, it's funny because 
I think Danny did a unbelievable job. Danny did an amazing job, no question about it. And you know, it's funny. I I I interviewed Danny a few weeks ago, Mm -hmm. and I. I said to him, you know, I almost feel a little bit intimidated setting up my cameras in front of a movie guy, you know. <laughs> and he said, oh, I got yeah. people for that, you know. Yeah. <laughs> because he is very, you know, very yeah. humble in that respect. Yeah. And, but, and, and by the way, I have to give kudos to the production team, the producers that worked on the film. Unlike The Wrecking Crew, where Denny had to do a lot of the heavy lifting himself, mm-hmm. the other producers that worked on the film, like Jonathan and Greg, um, they had their ability to kind of keep Denny, you know, focused in a certain direction and the collective energies of everybody is really what made it such a great movie. That's true. Well, the other factor that I think unintentionally worked in its favor is that it took so long to get the wrecking crew off the ground that that generation is, you know, less relevant, whereas the immediate family came out and these are people who are still, you know, moviegoers. Right. You know, so you're appealing to a generation yeah. that's still around, right. shall we say. Well, I, I'll say this about music. Unlike a lot of other art forms, when you hear a song, it takes you back to that moment. It's true. When you first heard it or the things that you were experiencing at the time. Like some people, they, they're in the middle of a breakup and that song becomes their shining light to get through the the drama. Yeah. So every there's something unique about music that's just so universal. I remember um, in the uh, late 80s and early 90s, I had the good fortune of working at a law firm that represented Phil Collins and Genesis. And I happened to be in Tokyo at the time when the guys were playing, so I went to the show. And I'm standing um, watching the band and the audience. and total Japanese audience. They knew every word to every song. Some of them may not have been able to speak English, but the universal language of music was so incredibly powerful to me. It's so true. And, you know, I mean, the the impact that music has on the human brain, the human psyche, uh, there's a a brilliant uh, musicologist by the name of Daniel Levitin. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's written a bunch of really great books about the, the impact that music has on the brain. Right. And I saw a presentation by him uh, a few years back at, I, I want to say it was either a NAM or an AES show right. or something like that. And he said, I'm going to play one nanosecond of a song and everyone in this room is going to recognize mm-hmm. it. And he played a nanosecond of Eleanor Rigby and sure enough. Wow. Yeah, because there's something about this yeah. universal language, as yeah. you say, it just yeah. it resonates. Yeah, and it's really it's our shared consciousness. Yeah. and you know, again, that's the understanding that that I think gives you the advantage to be able to work with these, you know, very very um, emotion-based artists mm-hmm. in that sense. You know, yeah, yeah. I had the good fortune of managing a, an artist by the name of Scatman John. Ah, oh, yes. Do, uh-huh. do you know who he was? Yes. Okay, and yes. here's a guy who was a stutterer his whole life. People made fun of him. He started as a jazz musician, mm-hmm. and um, a um, label president in Germany, uh, Manfred Zaringer, discovered him in Europe mm-hmm. and decided that he was going to take what Scatman did as a jazz scatter and put it over Euro dance beats. And the single went to number one and then the next single went to number one. And uh, I, I, there was one year where he was nominated for best male vocalist of the year in Europe opposite Michael Jackson. <laughs> and so to go from being ridiculed when he was a young kid. And so I tell the story because I was representing Mitsubishi at the time, and so I was having dinner with the senior vice president, and his wife looks at me at dinner and says, so why are you in Japan? And I said, well, you know, I came to meet with the president of BMG to talk about Scatman. And she goes, do, 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 do. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God, how mm-hmm. do you know that? And she was like 65, 68 years old, but the, effective nature of the power of music and crossing all boundaries, age, 
demographics, territories in other parts of the world, and he was a star. I mean, when I met with the president of BMG on that trip, he said to me, and I, you know, I mean, I always loved Scat Man, but didn't even realize the import of his success in Europe. He said, this is the third largest selling record of an international artist that we've ever had. And I said, who was one and two? And they said, Mariah Carey and Whitney Houston. Wow. And I'm like, and Scat Man's third? <laughs> so, the power of music. It's true, man. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. David Helfand, thank you for being my guest. My pleasure. Much appreciated. Thank you. It's been pleasure, a pleasure talking to you. Likewise. All right. Hey, I'm Daniel Keller. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button and join us each week for Insights and Sound.